no, no, no sound yet. Oh, thank you. Okay, if the panel could assemble, please, we'll get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for turning out on this uh, beautiful day in Washington, D.C. I'm Steve McDonald. I'm the uh, director of the Africa program and the project on leadership in building state capacity here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the center. Uh, I want to welcome our, our viewing audience. Uh, we, have, uh, we are being webcast live today. We're also on Twitter. Uh, and uh, if you want to follow it on Twitter, use the hashtag AT4C in reference to the conference and we will take Twitter questions later too so if you're if you're out there on Twitter uh, be feel free to call in on your questions um, the uh, today is a very exciting day for us uh, today's today's program on uh, uh, is a part of our African technological policy series uh, Africa women and youth as agents of change through technology and innovation uh, it brings together a lot of strands of things that we follow very closely here in, in our two uh, programs, uh, projects. Um, uh, obviously, women, women's leadership, the role of youth on the continent. Obviously, the cohort of youth is in a majority in almost every African country, if not all. And, uh, and uh, their, their, uh, their role is, is one that we, we're all following very closely. And then finally, of course, uh, information technology and innovation. Um, we have uh, assembled a quite a day for you today. Uh, with a couple of uh, expert panels. This morning's panel will be looking at uh, from local to global, rural to urban, problem solving through innovative solutions for sustainable development. Uh, but uh, just a moment of your time to tell you a bit about the Woodrow Wilson Center. We are, of course, the living memorial to former President Woodrow Wilson, um, who was the only American president to ever have a PhD and, and be a true academic. As you probably know, he was a president of Princeton University. I've had a chance to visit his birthplace down in Staunton, Virginia. And it's very interesting uh, to see the, the academic side of him. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a very, very serious writer um, and, uh, and uh, uh, um, intellect. And, and uh, in, in that spirit, uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, follows his ideals of trying to bring together the world of ideas, the world of, of uh, academic inquiry, the world of practitioners in the field with the world of policy. And today's event, of course, is a very good example of that. Um, where we can provide the kind of the political space for, uh, uh, for policymakers and scholars and practitioners to come together. Um, uh, I, uh, just a, a housekeeping matter or two, and this is directed at my moderator as much as at you. Uh, we, because we are being webcast, when we get to the question and answer session, uh, which is going to be a real major part of what we do because we like the interactive and interchange, uh, and we have an overflow room in, in outside too, so we'll probably be taking questions from there. Uh, but uh, please be sure to wait for a microphone to come your way so you're heard on the uh, video feed and uh, identify yourself and et cetera. There'll be microphones in the room that'll be passed around. Uh, I'm going to turn the proceedings over now to our first moderator, uh, Kevin Urama, who's the executive director of the African Technolo uh, Technology Policy Series Network uh, based in, uh, in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, Kevin uh, also is the inaugural president of the Africa Society for Ecological uh, Economics. And he's a professor in the School of Public uh, Leadership uh, at Stellenbosch University in South Africa and an adjunct professor at the Sir Walter Murdoch School of po Public Policy International uh, Affairs at the University of Murdoch in Western Australia. Uh, Kevin, you really get around. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I hope you don't do semesters at both schools at the same time. Uh, he holds a bachelor's and master's degree in agricultural economics from the University of Nigeria, where he's originally from. Uh, and a Master of Philosophy degree and a PhD in Land Economy from the University of Cambridge. Um, uh, Kevin is, is an old friend of mine. Uh, we've been working together in something we call the Southern Voices Network in which the ATPS is a, is a founding member and this is bringing together uh, research and policy institutes from around the continent of Africa uh, to work with them in trying to have views on, on issues of importance to the United States and Africa. Um, uh, be, being enlightened uh, by 
uh, African Voices, as, as it uh, implies in its title, uh, uh, where we have, uh, have uh, the scholarship and, and the intellect and the input from, uh, from those on the ground in Africa who are working on these issues, whether it be climate change, whether it be maternal health, whether it be conflict. Uh, it's not about the issue itself. It's being sure that policymakers in the United States are hearing not political voices, but, uh, uh, but fact-based, uh, uh, research-based uh, African voices on these issues. Kevin is very much a part of that network with us, and we're very proud to be associated with him. So with very little more to say on my part, let me turn it over to Kevin to introduce the panel and get us started. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Steve, and welcome to everyone to this very interesting um, meeting. Um, as we know, uh, as a background for, for this, this particular conference we are having, the youths of Africa and the, women's of, the women of Africa is the hub for development of that continent. If you think about population uh, dynamics of the continent, Africa is amongst the, the youngest and also youthful population uh, you get, uh, continent you, you, you have. And this can be seen as an advantage. It can also be seen as a disadvantage. And then what this meeting is supposed to be doing is actually highlighting the aspects of where the youths and women of Africa provides the engine for growth on the continent. And having worked with the African Youth Forum for Science and Technology and the African Women Forum for Science and Technology for a number of years now under the platform of the ATPS, I can actually testify that a lot of the growth we are seeing on the continent in these past two decades has actually come from these two groups um, quite a lot in, in terms of the social innovations that are happening different hubs of technological innovations, I ICT revolutions are happening amongst youths. And we're going to see some examples of that in this, in this meeting. And I hope that at the end of the meeting, we'll be able to highlight um, some of this good work that these innovators have been doing in their different areas of, of focus, uh, both within the continent and also in the diaspora, and also be able to provide uh, different kinds of skills that and networks that they can create in order to mainstream and upscale the good work that they're doing on the continent and so on. So uh, as Steve has said, the discussions, the web streaming are very important parts of this. We couldn't bring everybody uh, that are doing uh, these kinds of good work uh, into this room now. But I hope that if you're listening out there, you feel part of the process and can contribute through all the uh, web-based platforms that has been provided. So this morning, we are going to be hearing from four very interesting um, youth innovators and uh, women innovators also. We have Isaac um, Mongetutu, who is the Chief Innovations Officer for MFAM. I will leave the introduction of what MFAM is to, to him when he gets uh, uh, to, to speak. And after that, we will have Diana Mongere, who is the founder of Planet Green, and also Richard Seshi, who is the founder of Vivus Renewables, and um, Rahel Gatichu, who is the founder of and managing director of Afoleha LLC. So without much ado, I would like to call on the first speaker, who is um, Isaac Mongetitu to talk to us briefly on just about 10 minutes on what uh, MFAM is doing and how you see it really contributing to African growth and development. Thank you. Do I take one slide? You can do it from here or from there. Stand up here. Good. Okay, so my name is Isaac Mugetutu, and um, I work for a company called Amform Limited. Are you pursuing? We're blocking is it, you. Is it clear now? Okay, okay so um, I'm the innovations officer at Amform Limited, which is a company based in Nairobi, Kenya, and our domain is agriculture. So we build software and work with farmers uh, to increase their livelihoods, uh, basically move them from poverty and uh, increase their incomes. Um, so our focus is to improve food security both in Kenya and across Africa in the long run. And we're doing this through um, technology and media. 
So um, we, we basically tackled the idea of who grows your food. And this has been a major debate uh, across the world. And in on the recent years, what has been happening is there's been a lot of talk about um, food security in the continent and across the and across the globe. So our focus again, as of this time, it's really critical and we're at the right time and the, at the right place in Africa and with the issue of security, we're in the right domain. So we figured that we should take this thing and run with it. So we're trying to tackle the, the issue of food. And um, this is starting off from Kenya and will spread across Africa with our platform doing um, various things that I'll discuss um, shortly. So who's our target market? Our target market is small-scale farmers um, across, across Africa, starting with Kenya. And in Kenya, we have uh, a lot of small-scale farmers who contribute to the food supply in the country. But the problem that we're trying to tackle is that these small-scale farmers end up being harassed by middlemen. And what our application does, we have three avenues of service. One, price information. Two, um, group selling, and three, group buying. So price information, what our price information system does is offers farmers prices on different commodities in various markets. And this is through SMS technology. And the second model, which is group buying, we have agents who work with the same small scale, small scale farmers to aggregate produce, because what happens with buyers is once they approach farmers and you have little quantity, then they'll give you a, a you know, the lowest price since you're selling a small commodity. But our group selling model, which again works through SMS, allows a group of farmers to come together, raise the tonnage of the produce that they have, and have a better bargaining chip against buyers. And the third model is once these buyers have good knowledge of the price information, um, of price of the produce that they're trying to sell, they're able to bargain better, they get better incomes, they invest back into their farms, increasing the level of uh, production, and with that level of production and the, um, the group selling uh, technology that we put in place, they're able to sell better. Once they're able to get more income through, through the sales that they're making, um, they need to, again, go back to their farms and plant again. That's where our group buying model comes in. They allow the group of farmers again to come together and um, request for farm inputs, chemical fertilizers, that kind of stuff. And with that, um, they're able to go to these supply companies and bargain better again for a, a better price for this for these supplies. So th those are the three channels that we have, and each uh, builds on the other. With price information, they're able to um, the farmers are able to uh, bargain better, get more income. With group selling, the farmers again are able to um, sell at a better price. To any buyer, the the, the, the marketing, uh, you know, is they, they become more better, they're more visible on the market, and with the third one, they're able to again to get better prices um, to for their farm inputs. So generally, farmers in Africa don't have that bigger voice. So that's where we come in. We're able to um, um, let them text in since they have down phones. They don't have smartphones like what you have here. They have simple phones there, and all they can do is at best call and text. And our technology rides on that. So once they text into our service, what happens is this message hits our system, it's verified, and it goes on our website. And from the website, marketers can see what produce is on the ground, and they're able to contact the, buy the farmers directly and buy from them. So we're giving a voice to farmers through SMS technology and the web platform that um, most people have. Um, um, access to. The other problem that currently exists is um, no information and our price information system comes into place there. So farmers in Africa generally um, are riding blind on agriculture. They basically plant, hope to ha have a good harvest and hope to sell. It's all on hope and prayers. They go down on their knees when they plant and hope it rains and when it rains they hope they harvest, the, 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 you know, they have something good and they hope they'll get a market for it. So what we're trying to is bring a, a bit of clarity in, in the supply chain in agriculture in Kenya. And we're trying to give information back to farmers on all levels. First is price of their produce or the market when they're planting. 
Second is the price that the, 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 the buyers um, are bargaining on the produce that they have. So they would get SMS alerts on the different prices from different buyers. And then third is, you know, if the suppliers uh, getting f where they're getting their farm input from, then they'd get again alerts on the different prices of different commodities from, you know, different suppliers. So we're trying to give them more information on the different products that they have. Um, so that's just a normal farmer trying to get information the, the old way. Um, th th it's th through sharing a paper, you know, um, that was bought by one farmer across a group maybe during the break. Then these are middlemen. So um, middlemen are, are people we are trying to rehabilitate. Um, I won't say get rid of from the value chain. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to rehabilitate through our agent system. And um, most of them are, are men. Um, and they, they hustle farmers. They, 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 for, for example, a kilo of tomatoes, they would, they would sell... Um, for for very sorry okay yeah. okay sorry so so they would give the farmers uh, really mega prices and sell t up to three times four times even ten times more than what they're buying at Farmgate so uh, they're the guys we're trying to rehabilitate and bring them into our agent model which is um, a one layer kind of setup so you have buyers you have um, from agents then you have farmers as opposed to having a buyer, 10, uh, 10 middlemen, then the farmer. So if, if the price the farmer is getting is, is N, then the last broker is selling N times 10. So everybody's hurting. From the farmer is getting a, a, a really small price, and the end user getting a ridiculously high, high price for the same produce. So um, we're really trying to clean up the, the food chain and get rid of the food mafias in the value chain. These are some of the guys um, in one of our areas <coughs> back in Kenya. Um, so we're looking at could, could technology, uh, what, what role does technology play in, in all this? Again, I think I'll go back to, to what I said earlier. Is we're using the lowest kind of technology that is available to farmers. That's the group of people we're targeting, and that's SMS. And we are trying to use SMS, which is available to them, and try to deliver uh, information to them. So we are building mobile tools uh, that help small-scale farmers. So as of, uh, as of when we started, it was purely SMS, but we are growing as, as again, um, changes happen in the market. There are a lot of young people who have graduated in Kenya and Nairobi, and they don't have jobs. And we've seen a huge number uh, calling in to us, texting us, going on our Twitter accounts, and asking us, uh, what's the return on investment on commodity X? So there's a lot, a huge number of young people in back in Kenya and I'm guessing across Africa, who are interested again in agriculture. This is because there's a lot of value in it, um, and so we are building mobile tools straight from SMS. We have a, an Android application and a mobile web application uh, to cater for this kind of um, traffic. So again, you'll find the hu the, the larger population of farmers. Um, are women, but th the people uh, again who are, ag uh, are benefiting from um, the proceeds that go into the women farming are the men. So the women go to to the shamba to the farms. They plow, they plant, they harvest, they sell, but the money goes into the pocket of of the husbands. And what what the husbands do, they just go out and drink up all the money. Then come planting season again, the women have to you know, hustle and <coughs> raise the money to plant again. So it's a vicious cycle. And what we're trying to do to get rid of this vicious cycle is um, use um, a mobile technology again based uh, out of Kenya called M-Pesa, which is a mobile transfer technology that I think is uh, well known across the world. So we have like tw 29 million subscribers in Kenya, mobile subscribers, and two thirds of the population ride on mobile money, have access to mobile money, and are using, actively using mobile money. So what our platform does is, um, once you know the, the, the woman or the lady farmer subscribes to our system, once she sells through our system, we send money directly to her phone via mobile money. So it doesn't 
sort of goes to the pocket to the pocket of, the, of his husband so he has she has the money in her phone and she can use it best way she knows how so those are the kind of things we're trying again to to work around so um again build market linkages um by marketing the, the farmers produce uh both on our on our sms platform and our web platform uh because you'll find most buyers are web you know a tech savvy web can, can access the website and we're trying to build the market linkages uh, straight from the ground um, and, and hit the buyers who are a bit tech savvy more than the farmers. So we, we're trying to connect the two uh, using different technologies, but at, at the same time, make it an efficient channel. Um, our, our third service, uh, as I talked about, uh, group uh, buying allows the farmers to access cheaper inputs. That makes their return on investment uh, better than what they used to. So MFARM was, I'll talk about how it was founded. It, it, it was founded by three ladies um, at, at a uh, setup. It's an innovation hub in Kenya called iHub. And what happened is there's a lady, the, one of the founders called Jamila was going through papers in, uh, while she was interning at iHub and she could see the constant uh, hurting of farmers on the paper. So on a napkin, uh, Jamila and Susan, the other co-founder, drew up the idea. And um, I don't know if it's through lack of opportunity, but they say when um, preparation meets opportunity, then success is born out of it. So they were writing, the drafting the small idea um, on a napkin. And in the next few weeks, there was a competition, IPO 48, which is um, based off a Dutch embassy. Um, the Dutch embassy in Kenya, and they won a thousand euros. So um, Jamila, Susan, and Linda Komboka, who are the three founders of MFARM, took up this competition and they won it, and they won the 10,000 um, euros. And this is the money that was used to, f to set up MFARM um, in initially. And now we have up to 20 employees, and 60% of them being actual ladies, and them channeling a lot of our traffic of farmers to the system more than the actual men so it's 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 um it's incredible what women can do with their resilience <laughs> um so this is kind of of the the sms you, you can send out so you send out a keyword price sweet potatoes being the produce and the location nairobi to our short code and what you get is you know the price of sweet potatoes in that town so this is just a simple SMS, and you can get back feedback quite easily um, through SMS, and that's what the farmers actually use. Um, on the website, then, once you text in, I don't know, the slide isn't so good, but once you text in, once the farmer texts in, it hits our website directly. So it's SMS to web and in a very fashionable manner. And we have a whole verification system um, running in the back. So you, you can contact the farmer directly. And if the farmer is under our agent, then we make commission off sales. We are for profit company, so we make commission off sales. And the buyer pays us for, it's called a finder's fee, I think, for the finder's fee. So yeah, so um, the farmer uses the phone. Uh, everybody's happy, then you just close the deal at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what we are going to do is to reserve questions and answers to the uh, well, until we have heard from the other ones because some of the innovations may be interacting. Okay. Let me call on Diana Mongare, founder of Planet Green, to come and present on her work. Good morning, everyone. Sorry. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Diana Kiribu Mangare. I'm 19 years old and I come from Kenya. My project is called Planet Green. And you can imagine in a society where all we see when we walk around is such. You walk outside your house and maybe your neighbor has thrown the garbage next door. Your children cannot play because you're afraid they're going to get cut or pricked by sharp objects that are everywhere. 
and you also see pictures of this there are pigs everywhere cows walking all over the place in the dirt the garbage the garbage piles all over your houses and hospitals and schools so this is what we go through in Kenya and I'm sure in many, many other African countries there's so much waste that is piled all over the place with no organization of collection even in the streets of towns it's the same story so I noticed this problem was hindering a lot of activities in my place. My brothers couldn't play easily at home, and I decided, let me do something about it. So that's how I started Project, project Planet Green. So my project has three sections, and this is the first section, which is garbage separation and collection. So I decided to, to distribute um, polythene bags to my neighbors, um, where they keep the recyclable waste separately from the non-recyclables. So the, there's the black paper bag for the non-recyclables and the clear paper bags for the recyclables. Once they put the garbage in the paper bags, they are collected every week at a fee. And most people would ask me, so why should I separate my waste? I'm used to throwing my waste outside the houses. I'm used to just throwing it anywhere. So you don't tell me to start separating them now. So I had to get an incentive for them because um, they live in we have plots, so we have like 10 houses um, being in the same surrounding. So they would have leaders to organize the collection, which was rotational to every, every owner of a house there. So they figured if I'm going to get an incentive for collecting, for ensuring everyone collects the waste, so why not do it? And so um, the waste are collected every week, and I take the, the recyclables to a recycling company that is also in, in my hometown, Nakuru, Kenya. And also, there's a second, there's a second platform. So, what happens? We have so many activities going around our houses. We have the carpenters. Um, we have carpenters all over the place. We have um, shops just next to us. Basically, it is the resi res residential areas are just a hub of many activities. And so, one of them is the uh, is the carpentry. And what happens is that most most carpenters do their work and after after they left with the the wood chippings, they burn them down, which is very annoying because it produces a lot of smoke. And so what I decided is to get um, a few chicken farmers who are my mom's friends and um, link them up to the, to the carpenters. So I used to buy, I buy the, um, the sawdust from the carpenters at a fee, then I sell it to the chicken farmers later, later on. And what's really amazing about this um, chicken, um, the, cup, the wood chippings is that once the once the wood chippings have stayed in the in the chicken farms for let's say a month or two, the chicken farmers later on use them in their farms as manure, or at times they use it as cow feed, and this is really um, good for the chicken farmers because after getting it from me, they still get money from it. You know, they sell it to other people, and also the chicken um, can produce their eggs really healthy because we know that the ch um, wood chippings help chicken in keeping warm and and keeping their houses dry. So this is really nice to them. This is good for their growth of their, of their, of their, of their businesses, yes. <laughs> and thirdly is this environmental uh, awareness. So I figured um, just by doing this in my community and working with the older generation, it's harder for the message to get to them. And I think it's easier to get um, the information through children so I, I visit three schools in Nakuru. One is called Kiamaina Primary School and Jacaranda Primary School and Nakuru Day School. So in, this three, in these three schools, I started up environmental clubs where I visit after every two weeks and give them talks about um, the environment and why they should keep, keep it clean, why should they should plant trees and whatnot. So this is one of the environment groups in Jacaranda Primary School. <laughs> and you can see around there are some trees and, some, and there's a garden where they started planting maize. And this area was actually, before it was, um, they used to throw their waste around there. So there was, we made up a cleanup day and we cleaned it all up. Then we started planting um, the maize there. So basically when I started this project, we started the res my resources of 10,000 shillings. And I got this from my mom after I begged her that I needed to start a project. <laughs> <laughs> and she was wondering why, why is she doing this project? Because I had just finished high school and I was yet to get into university, so and I was just 
chilling, doing nothing. <laughs> so I, I figured, let me just do something in my life before I get into university. And then also I work with five people who help me in, garbage, in the transportation of the garbage and also the transportation of the sodas to the chicken farmers. And then they're the leaders of the plots of houses who basically ensure that the garbage is collected every week. And I also think the school children are a great resource because I know once they get home every evening, they'll tell their parents, you know, we've been told in school, we should not throw the, our waste anywhere. And I believe that this young generation will spread the information much faster to the rest of the world. Yes. And one of the reasons, one of the many reasons I'm doing this is first of all, there's been a lot of environmental degradation in, Af in Kenya, Africa, and I'm sure in the rest of the world, because so many, so many people are out to, devel to make developments, to make company, to build up industries, but they don't take in the factor that some of the activities that we take part in um, have a negative <coughs> effect to the environment. Some of them produce gases that are like carbon gases, and some companies, especially in Kenya, where there isn't so much uh, emphasis on environmental awareness. Um, these companies wouldn't take, f take into consideration the fact that they can put up a few, just a few, um, just a few better machines that would help reduce this waste. And so, with my project, I, I hope to restore environmental wellness in my society, and also encourage most people, e everyone, to, to utilize the resources because by wasting plastics, by burning plastics, by throwing out paper all over the place, it's a very, very great waste. We have companies that are being, like we have um, a company called Pan, Af Pan Africa Paper that produces paper. That company was, was, um, was closed down because there wasn't, th they, didn't have exactly, they didn't exactly have trees to cut down to produce more paper. But here we are throwing paper every day, paper that could be recycled to, pro to help such companies not get closed down. And also, um, as you saw in the first picture, there's a lot of, there's a lot of water, that sewage that is all over the place, especially now that there are floods. It's the rainy season in Kenya now, and there's a lot of floods. And this, these are the times when s waste just mixes with water, and we, we have so many cases of cholera, we have cases of typhoid. And so by helping um, people domestic, um, domestic use um, wastes, like waste from houses, by helping them being organized and being collected every week, we I'm trying to help um, reduce such cases of such diseases, especially um, in the web, in the residential areas, and also um, in all this, I hope to empower the children and the youth because I believe the youth are the future, and the youth are going to take the world to a greater place. Thank you. And so. Basically, as you can see, <coughs> we want to see children happy, playing, and when we do so, we'd like to make money. That's how I say the project, because it's a business where you get money and at the same time, you change lives. So my life is changed and the whole, and everyone's life is also changed to as, as a whole. Yeah. Wow, MFAM decided, <laughs> <to laughs> <to, laughs> decided to get into my, my slides. Anyway, so. <laughs> Why environmental conservation? <coughs> um, when I was in high school, I joined um, the Environment Club and we took part in plant, um, tree planting activities. We set up a botanical garden in the school. We went for fund fundraising walks to clean Nairobi River and Nairobi Dam. And through this process, I, I got so fond of this environment. Like I'd always talk about, tell people I'm in the Environment Club and I was really proud of it. And I grew this great passion for it, and it's through this that I figured um, there is so much to life. If only we take care of our environment, we could uh, we could make the world such a better place. And that is why I chose this path for business. Yeah, and I believe that environmental conservation is the way to go. It's the only way that we can make um, life much cheaper and much bearable, and we could um, help reduce costs and reduce um, waste of our resources. Yes, and I hope that with my paper bags and my polythene bags for garbage collection, we can develop into actual bins that I've been seeing around this place and it's really amazing. And hopefully it will spread throughout Kenya and the rest of the world. And um, the, f the, f the late Wangari Mathai, 
that Peace Laureate, who was from Kenya, she was a great environmentalist in Kenya, she said, nature is unforgiving, that when you cut a tree, one day, one time you'll need that tree, and you won't get any help. So if nature is unforgiving, we should take care of it now, and we should um, take care of it now because we want um, our the future generation to enjoy life and not to suffer as maybe we are suffering, yeah? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Diana. Let me call on the next speaker, Richard Seshir, who is the founder of Vivius Renewables, to come and speak to us about that innovation. Thank you. Ten minutes. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I stand in front of you today because I wanted to share with you a story. Uh, it's basically a story of a startup uh, that is being led by young Africans. Uh, it's a story of a startup that is using uh, technology for social impact. Uh, so um, uh, I'm Richard Seshi. I'm the founder of Vivus, uh, which is a startup based in Ghana and Ivory Coast. And uh, we stand uh, for mobility plus mobile solutions uh, for an, an, Af an Africa that feels itself. Um, so speaking about agriculture, I uh, wanted to give a sense of the context. Uh, when we're looking at the challenges that are confronting uh, the agricultural sector in sub-Saharan Africa, you have many of them. So they range from land issues to soil fertility and climate change uh, to access and the cost to finance uh, to the lack or the inadequation of extension services uh, from men, uh, farmers, men and women, uh, empowerment, mobility, and marketing. So you've got those huge issues uh, that are confronting the agricultural sector in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so uh, we know that with the recent world food crisis, uh, there's been a lot of initiatives and organizations that are addressing uh, many of those issues right now. And uh, so we felt that they're doing a good job. Uh, but we felt that uh, we had two areas, uh, mobility and marketing, where we had some sub-issues uh, which were not receiving the full attention they deserved. Uh, so let me take an example, for example. When we're speaking of marketing today, or sales of in agriculture in Africa, for example, we have a lot of focus on pricing information. So making sure, for example, that farmers have pricing information of their crops in cities so that they are in a better position to bargain with uh, smallholder, uh, with traders. Uh, now, the point is that uh, what about, for example, the food distribution in cities, for example? Uh, it's highly informal, it's highly inefficient, and something can be done about it. So is there really a mobility? Is there really a marketing challenge when we, it comes to agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, yes, and I would like to shed some light on some of those facts. Uh, so when we're speaking of mobility, uh, we realize that Africa is dominated, agriculture in Africa is dominated by over, uh, uh, by millions of smallholder farmers. In Ghana, for example, we have three million smallholder farmers, and they cultivate on an average of two hectares, okay? So imagine you have millions of small plots, for example, and this uh, amounts to a significant dispersion of crops. And up until now, uh, what we realize is that there's been an efficient sourcing. Because what happens is that you either are a trader, so you bring your truck, it's expensive to rent, uh, it requires special aggregation conditions, and basically because the traders own uh, the rent, they are able uh, to be in a position of negotiating power when it, when it comes to pricing with smallholder farmers. So now, if you're a smallholder farmer and you're not happy with the price that is being offered to you by a trader, what you do, is that you usually have to rely on any mobility option you have. So you either use head portage, you either walk, you either have an animal traction, sorry, uh, or you either use your bicycle and so on. So for smallholder farmers who don't use those options because it's extenuating, what they do is that they come together and try to access public transportation. So one thing we realize is that about 45% of average transportation charges uh, occur during the first 28% of the transport distance when farmers, smallholder farmers want to access this. So this is extremely expensive. And we realize that uh, 
in general, there is a lack of cargo services in rural areas. What do we mean by that? It means that it does not only restrict to uh, going out, getting your food produced, transported. Uh, you have many, lack, many, many other services that could be provided. Uh, for example, the collection of firewood, the collection of water, for example, uh, having to go and buy your fertilizer coming back and forth. Uh, for example, uh, doing primary processing activities such as maize, threshing and drying, etc. So there's that huge lack of cargo mobility services in rural areas. Uh, one consequence of it, for example, is that you have agricultural residues, which represent over 4 million tons uh, in Ghana, which is the largest source of residues. And what happens is that it's not being uh, used or maximized uh, because it's in small quantities. And if you are a renewable energy project developer, you tend to rely on concentrated sources of biomass, such as solid municipal waste and, and others. Uh, so you have it either when it could power more than 4 million homes in Ghana. Uh, so this is the mobility challenge. The marketing challenge is more of an opportunity uh, because you have African cities now which are fast growing. You have 480 million people now who live in cities and this represents uh, a market uh, that is estimated to be used at 50 US billion dollars per year. Uh, so what happens is that uh, because African economies has been export-led economies, when it comes to domestic food staples, uh, the supply chain is highly informal and is highly inefficient. Uh, so those sales are dominated traditionally by traders, informal traders, by informal women vendors. And uh, at the end of the day, during the commercialization process, you end up with up to 30% of food produce that is unsold produce, and that goes to waste. <laughs> so again, this is a major challenge in agricultural supply chain uh, that uh, uh, we decided to act upon. So now, those are harsh facts, okay? <laughs> and, uh, but we we, uh, we, there's another story which is more personal, uh, which has to do with uh, frustration and expertise. Uh, my personal story is that I was in India in 2008, coming back to Africa, and I was really frustrated with the high prices of fruits and vegetables in Ghana. So this was my frustration and sparked an interest uh, into you know, investigating the agricultural supply chain and asking myself, can something be done about it? And I remember that um, as being as young as eight years old, my family had uh, a family uh, uh, restaurant and food distribution business. And uh, basically for 10 years, I had a chance to interact into that world. I spent the last five years then uh, abroad working with global organizations such as Microsoft and Ashoka. And I, it kind of came together, you know, uh, those past experiences, that current experiences, that frustration, and uh, that's where Vivus was founded. So recognizing those problems, what is Vivus? So Vivus is a social enterprise that is based in Ghana that is trying to create a better supply chain for domestic food staples. And we're doing that by working on one side at the sourcing level and another side on the trading level. So at the sourcing level, what we're doing is that uh, we are setting up rural mobility centers in villages or in cluster of villages and those centers basically are equipped with cargo motorbikes. Uh, we believe that cargo motorbikes are an efficient way to collect small quantities of crops. And at the trading level, we're using uh, mobile technology uh, that is actually helping to create a better distribution channel that is involving women vendors. Uh, so how did it start it? Uh, the first thing is that uh, in 2010, uh, we took 18 months and we took the time to, uh, to conduct uh, market research. Uh, so we spent months and months in villages, interacting with hundreds of farmers, uh, going through that, uh, many of the rural areas in Ghana. And, uh, and with those insights we had, we also had the opportunity to go uh, uh, abroad. And there was opportunity to uh, have um, a best practice system. The idea was to go abroad and try to see when it comes to supply chain, uh, which are the companies or social enterprises abroad uh, that were fundamentally reinventing the supply chain. And, 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 and so we had a chance to go to India, for example, uh, visit a couple of social enterprises which are doing an, an extraordinary work in that area. And uh, so that range from agriculture to used clothes collection uh, to um, another company that is setting up rural shops throughout uh, India. 
manufacturing, accessing uh, uh, quality goods, and to another company that is using technology to improve the dairy milk sector. So that was um, uh, an, uh, an interesting moment in terms of capturing the best practices. So I'm just unfolding the story of Vibus. So after those best practices, what happens is that we started to strategize. And this is where ideas uh, or our solutions started to emerge. So speaking about the work Vivos is doing in terms of mobility, when it comes to rural mobility centers, uh, this is a typical example of someone using a bicycle to collect food produce, okay? It can be head portrait or something else. So what we realize is that you have cargo bicycles or cargo motorbikes, uh, which basically can carry loads from 100 kgs to two tons, to up to two tons. And they are suitable for rural areas because they are low cost, uh, they are able to sustain, uh, you know, rough roads, and in terms of maintenance, uh, they are re relatively uh, uh, able to be maintained on under a, a longer time. So what we did is that, uh, what we're doing is that we're trying to look at a village or a cluster of village, and we put one rural mobility center. So this center is comprised of cargo motorbikes, of cargo bicycles, of detachable trailers that you could see there, and we provide uh, to uh, rural households those services as an infrastructure, as a service model. It means that they actually the village or the cluster village don't own the, the, the equipment or the cargo motorbikes, but we make sure that they are able to access those services, renting those uh, uh, bicycles, renting those cargo motorbikes at a, at a, at, at a cheap cost, at a low cost. Uh, so. Uh, we had uh, an organization in Ghana that was called the Ghana Bamboo Bikes that was using, uh, that was already producing bamboo bicycles, which are selling well in Ghana. So the idea was to try to prototype uh, a cargo, cargo bicycles. Uh, so we worked with a uh, university a student design team uh, from the Netherlands called TU Deft. And uh, so they literally spent six weeks in Ghana uh, trying to interact with uh, farming communities and and trying to really uh, capture what were the cargo mobility needs in those rural areas, and finally uh, uh, the cargo mot cargo bicycle model was prototyped. Uh, in addition, of course, to cargo motorbike, sorry, the cargo bicycle was prototyped. In addition to the cargo motorbikes uh, manufactured by other companies. Uh, so now, where we stand today is that uh, we are working with two farming communities in Ghana, uh, up to four thousand farmers. And uh, uh, our idea is that within the next three months, uh, we, we implement uh, two uh, mobility, rural mobility centers. Uh, we were able to secure a substantial grant from a US-based foundation just last month. And uh, this will allow us to, to pilot uh, uh, the project. Uh, on the sales level, on the sales level, uh, what we're doing is that we currently uh, leveraging uh, mobile phone technology. So to have a sense of what is happening is that uh, women vendors who actually sell food produce to consumers usually rely on holds on traders. So the traders go to the village, they bring trucks full of produce, and they are not able to anticipate the demand of those women vendors. So at the end of the day, in the evening, you get the food produce, a part of it that is unsold, up to 20, 30 percent. So we're taking the, pro the, the problem on its head by actually going and meeting those women vendors. We register them and we actually allow, send them what you call deal of the day SMS. So if you ama, for example, selling orange, uh, you actually, let's say, if you, you want a bag of 40 kgs of orange, that costs $10, you can have it for $9, okay? So you are able to actually pre-order what you need. So we aggregate those orders, and then we source exactly the amount of food produced that is needed, instead of having that waste. So uh, we currently uh, started a pilot with uh, around 100 women vendors, and uh, uh, using a platform called Telerivate to be able to do that, sending the deal of the day SMS. Um, the reaction that we initially thought we'll get uh, was this. Uh, instead, uh, instead, we're getting uh, uh, another reaction. I'm just sharing this because uh, uh, we had one of our hypotheses that was challenged. Uh, it was the fact that in spite of us sending the SMS to the women, telling them we get them the best price on the market, they still prefer to shop around. Okay, they still prefer to shop around. So we're still uh, exploring new approaches, and this is something that is a work in progress. The impact we see is that uh, uh, by rolling out 
our integrated supply chain, but looking at the mobility and at the sales level, uh, we want to make sure that we increase up to four times efficiency in carrying rural goods, and also make sure that uh, we benefit, uh, in women vendors benefit from an increase in income of up to 10%. Uh, so Vivus uh, is a dynamic social enterprise, uh, and then we look forward uh, to your support in our journey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, we call on the, our last speaker for the session, uh, Rachel Gatechu, founder of and managing director for Afuleha. Good day. Good morning. <laughs> So my presentation is online. So I don't know if some of you know Prezi.com. It's a PowerPoint online. So I'm going to do this from here. These are the technologies that we look to bring to Africa, given the fact that the climate is there, the environment is there, the youth are there, and the youth are engaged. They're astute, they're savvy, so this is what we're gonna use to promote Africa and relationships. So the darkest thing about Africa has always been our ignorance of it. I don't think it, Africa is a poor c continent. Uh, it's rich in terms of resources, it's in terms of manpower, and it's, in it's potential and opportunity. So looking back, uh, path to my entrepreneurship, just a brief recap in terms of my journey, international development, private sector, I've worked with different organization companies working on programs and also communication strategies. For international development, developing programs, especially towards the diaspora, the youth, youth empowerment, and also entrepreneurship. When, we st when I started Afrolohar, it came out after, after a few years of working in international development, especially in Ethiopia and Ghana. And having worked there, I understood the demographic trends, the population trend in terms of how, a con uh, how Africa is becoming a youthful continent, as uh, Mr. Ruma was saying. So when I understood the economic trend as well in terms of where we could be situated by 2020, 2050, I understood what was necessary. That first and foremost, we need to change the perception of Africa as Africans ourselves and also towards the foreign uh, view of Africa. So how do we do that is by, by doing communication strategies, creative productions, creating strategic partnerships, and also in terms of uh, creating user experiences using technology by building content and ha bringing access to information, positive information of Africa and the opportunities available. So why Afro-Lahar? Well, we provide communication strategies, public relations, event programs management, creative productions, integrated marketing. In a nutshell, what my fellows are doing here, we want to promote it. We want to showcase that Africa, Africans are doing great things, bringing solutions to the table, and it's an African-led initiatives. This is what's important, that we are creators and we are innovators. Uh, our creations, we also, besides providing services, we also create, we are creating our own platforms. One which is, I'll, I'll show you later on, which is Agrifica, which is based on promoting agribusiness opportunities on the continent, which is a centralized platform. We're doing a soft launch now. Uh, Tecrica, which is a technology based as well, is to promote the technology environment and how it's transforming Africa. Kimwili, which is means in Swahili physical, it's promoting athleticism, to, uh, teamwork, uh, and we're approaching health and wellness by using athleticism. Uh, and the last and but not least is Knock Knock Africa, which is a product branding. So we tr we're going to be uh, hopefully launching by the end of the summer. It's a one-year 
uh, technology development that took us. We did the beta testing, and now we're working to guarantee, well, secure some prospective investors in order to launch it effectively. The this Knock Knock Africa, especially is one that is necessary given the fact that it's a part of diplomacy to a certain degree because it's product branding and given that diplomacy will be somewhat decentralized in 2020 2050 products become your branding tool as as equally as your nation so as my peers have said as well we have a youthful population the u.s has uh, the one of the after brazil it has the largest diaspora, and uh, the U.S. has the opportunity to utilize its diaspora to bring greater partnership between U.S. and Africa, be it in trade, be it in terms of investment with DDI, be it in terms of infrastructure, be it in policy. The U.S. has an opportunity, immense op opportunity to create linkages with Africa and African youth. In terms of image building, the image building as we were talking about in terms of public relation, it's important when we're talking about investment, work, when we're talking about women entrepreneurship, youth entrepreneurship, uh, youth empowerment, it's very important that we understand that image is important. Because when we talk about Africa, we often talk, when we see the images that we were, so we're seeing, we're seeing the slums, we're seeing uh, the destitute. But if we look in certain cities, Certain cities are as developed as certain cities in New York, uh, in as in certain places in New York. So I think when we talk about Africa, it's important that we also emphasize in, uh, on the positive, on the story, the shared stories of Africa and the common stories that we have in terms of the accomplishments, uh, the, the developments. Uh, even though they're not to the scale that we wish it was, we still have to emphasize and continue on because the positive stories just will fuel more positive stories. But if we keep on talking on the about the negative, we'll remain in the negative. Uh, in terms of investment promotion, the F GDP is growing in Africa, and we all know, uh, everybody's talking about it, that it is important. But to in increase investment, you need to build confidence. So the card you build confidence is by changing the perception, by greater promotion, b better linkages, better partnerships. And we Africans also have to learn to work in partnerships. Uh, so in terms of African diplomacy, as I was saying, it's still it's being decentralized. By 2020, 2050, it will be so decentralized that social media and technology and nation, build nation branding will become at the forefront of diplomacy. And so I was talking about the Agrifica. I've, I will show you just uh, briefly in terms of what Agrifica platform is. It it's a centralized platform where you will find events, where you find resources, where you will find a list of uh, all the NGOs, businesses that are working on agribusiness. The aim, uh, the long-term goal with the Agrifica is to organize program based on on the continent, we're already reaching out to a few youth that we have already relationship with, be it in Ghana, and Togo, and Benin, and Nigeria, and in Ethiopia, and Uganda. We're reaching out to them in terms of how you can, uh, how you can merge technology and agribusiness, but based on their needs. So each, one, each locally uh, program based that they're gonna craft and we're gonna support them being by being media, s media s sponsors, but also by assisting them in terms of the program development, in terms of the capacity, in terms of the branding, in terms of the communication materials that they need to produce to show that they, they also have to make everything that they pr produce to a scale. Uh, in terms of the Tecrica, Tecrica is a similar platform. Uh, we'll have really resources, we'll have events. Uh, it has also uh, uh, the iHubs that are being built across the continent. So it's a centralized platform where be wherever you are on, on the planet, you can access it and see what the be it on technology aspect or be it in the agribusiness aspect. In terms of the Kim Willy, it's very much geared toward the youth. Um, we believe that uh, they say in 2020, 20% of Africa will have NCDs, the non-communicable di non diseases. Now, how is it important that today that we're not talking about it? So what we're doing is that we're reaching out to a few athletes, already established athletes here in the US. They have a lot of foundations. And so we're reaching out to them to create partnerships and organize certain uh, sports 
led events on the continent and create certain partnership between these foundations and already existing associations and foundations on the continent. So we are really about building bridges, building linkages, building partnerships because we don't believe necessarily in replicating what has been done but re really linking it up to scale it and to make it more effective. Knock Knock Africa it came about by understanding again the product need and also AGOA, which is the African Growth Opportunity Act, which has somewhat been underutilized. So we took the opportunity here and saw that it, was, it could be scaled. It, it just needs a, a very refined business model, which we have developed a refined business model. We're talking to, to be able to patent it as well in order to license it out. So overall, we're gonna do what we're doing is really one, showcasing what African youth and African entrepreneurs are doing. Two, creating linkages. And three, also us promoting in, in a segue uh, the opportunities available on the continent. Um, and that would be it. Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, at this point, we will now uh, take your contributions, comments, questions, and so on um, to all the four presenters. Uh, before I turn to you for that, I'd like to really appreciate um, what I'm hearing from these youths and ladies, and um, also to assure that, you know, in Africa, you have a lot of them actually doing a lot of very many good work that's going on on the continent. Um, if you are a youth innovator on the continent and you are joining us through the web services, please would like to hear your voice through the Twitters and everything that, th that has been provided. So please, uh, I want to encourage those who are not in the room to participate as well as those who are sitting here, here with us. And we look forward really to the youths and women of Africa to change the story. Um, it's, it's real that in many, many ways, um, those of us sitting outside the continent often see only the, the downsides of the continent. Africa is a very great continent with lots of opportunities. And from the current growth estimates in terms of growth models for the next 10, 20 years, Africa is just the place to be. In the past 20 years, Africa is the only continent, I would say, um, that has not really taken too much of a bashing from the financial uh, recession that, ha that has happened in the global economy. And it's really because over 40% of that continent's GDP comes from the informal sector and a lot of social innovations that, that you see here. So in my view, this is the future for the continent, the youths and the women. And also these social innovations are really very interesting to me as a scholar of innovation on the continent because these are innovations that are actually addressing Africa's problems. Specific immediate problems, the way I used to talk to the youth program in my organization, I say, think about the program of your, uh, the problem of your immediate problem of your grandmother the backyard, the things that happen in the communities. Like when I listened to the young Kenyan innovator on how she began to think about waste recycling. It may sound common to us here, but if you've been to Kibera in Kenya, if you've been to some of the slums there, you will understand that this is really a hero of her age to begin to think of how can I address this particular problem uh, in my community. And that is really the, int the interest that this, this thing brings. So it's really exciting, and I want to thank all of you for the very, uh, uh, I mean, encouraging, uh, brave steps you are taking. And the, the thing I didn't hear so much in your presentations are the institutional environments and challenges that you're facing, which is very good, because that's the thing about the youth. <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to turn to, uh, to us to uh, ask questions, seek clarifications, and also please do identify opportunities for linkages and strengthening. I already have, I'm already seeing there's a lot of uh, linkages that can be created, which I can discuss with you Paul, later through our youth program and our women program, and other innovators that have gone a little further than, than you have. There was an amazing story that was told by one of the innovators in, 
in the meeting we had in November in the Africa at the Africa Union Commission. I think the Wilson Center was also represented. And this was a young South African who just did exactly like you did, all of you, in terms of seeing a problem and wanting to solve it. One of you started with 10,000 Kenya shillings. He started with uh, 20,000 rand that he had after going to university, being jobless in the Soweto slums, and didn't know what to do, and started from simply going to wash cars for the rich neighbors that he had in, um, in, in Johannesburg, and realized that these people would give him some tips after, but sometimes are rushing him, you know, do this thing quickly, I need to go to work. And he just mobilized a lot of Soweto youths and formed a company to start washing your cars before you wake up. That was his own idea. <laughs> just give us access to your garage or park your car outside. It will be sparkling neat every day as that you drive it, and you we won't disturb you. So before you wake up, your vehicles are washed. And he started from that and started from that, and now it's a multi-billion dollar enterprise. He now has 18 companies employing about 1,800 and something staff globally, including professors. <laughs> 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 so please, you, your starting may look little, it may look small, but that is what innovation is. Keep at it, just keep going, you will get there. Thank you. Yes? My name is Barbara Dello, and um, my question is, I heard one of the uh, speakers uh, say that the youth are sometimes um, more open to new ideas and change than some of the older citizens, if, if I understood right. And I wondered how difficult is it to implement change, um, in, and is it your experience that there's any fear among some of the people in your communities that change is being pushed on Africa from the outside? Did you get the question? Um, I didn't get the last part. Can you repeat the last uh, part of your question? Yeah. Um, in your experience, is there any fear among the people in your communities uh, that change is being pushed on um, Africa or their communities in Africa from outside nations or outside, you know, their own communities. Um, I said, I said about um, how the youth um, take up change much easily, because um, the older generation wasn't there when there was the whole social media, the whole um, so much information being passed out to them, and embracing the change is much harder for the older generation, our parents, than the youth. So, like. In my in my in my project where I have to give people to tell people to collect that the the older people are more um, <laughs> resistant because they are, they're used to throwing the waste like they've lived all their life throwing the waste anyhow and so the youth it's much easier for the youth to adapt to these changes because I'm sure they've seen on TV how in other cities um, waste is being collected they see how much better people live in other areas and they want to bring this change to the houses. And yes, um, many Africans, many Kenyans are a bit resistant to change as they feel it's being pushed upon them from the outside world. And the, like for example, that um, we have Kenyans saying, um, we want to bring our own change. We don't want to take up maybe technology from other countries. We want to bring it up right from here, like right from Kenya home. And even with the whole um, being resistant to help from other areas and ideas from other parts of the world, we still rely on the rest of the world to grow um, better and to get a whole different view from everyone else. So I think even with the whole resilience and the whole resistance, sorry, re resistance, um, acknowledging the help from, from all over the world and acknowledging the ideas is very important so that we can grow because we can only look up to the better the better country, uh, the better okay, the better developed countries and the countries, uh, the countries with um, where things have have been done right to learn from them. <coughs> so there's definitely a um, need to learn from other countries. Okay, thank you. If any of you wants to add to that, 
um, I'd, I'd go ahead and say that, um, you know, as Newton said, that, you know, you only see father when you stand on the shoulders of giants. So the, the idea of um, it has to start um, right from ground zero. Um, even us innovators uh, look outside and, and see what others are doing and take that in. So again, in our project, for example, at MFAM, we, we, we get a lot of resistance to change. But the thing is, it's a trust mo trust network, trust model. It, it works the same way um, as the um, as exchange stock exchange system. You know, guys trust that the stock will, will rise, and once that once there's that confidence, you'll see a stock price go up. It'll shoot through the roof just with with confidence, nothing else. The same way in agriculture, what we do is we train a couple of farmers in a very small area, trade with them and let the rest see that. Once they see that, then a trust, you know, a, some form of trust in whatever innovation we're bringing into the community takes place. And once that happens, people start adopting the new, the new technologies that we're trying to build, and um, th they, became, they bec become a better community. So yes, there's a lot of resistance, but um, we're, we're trying to work around it. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult, but it's worth it, yeah. Now, the, just to add to that, there's been uh, there's a document out there on the African Manifesto for Science, Technology, and Innovation, where we've done uh, three-year research going through with African governments, policymakers, universities, and so on to look at why innovation is actually not happening so fast on the continent, and that resistance to change does come up. But the kinds of technologies that are resisted are technologies that are actually not fitting the social fabrics of, of the community. For instance, somebody might be saying, okay, but why polythene bags? You know, we have waste recycling uh, things already here. Why not just send that there? But then if you send some of those waste recycling things there, it becomes water collection uh, 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 tools because they don't have other systems to collect the water. So these are very simple examples of why when a technology is not embedded in a society, what we call socialization of science and technology, then it, it meets with uh, some challenges in terms of adoption and deployment of those technologies. And that is where social innovations like these ones become very useful because they, I mean, for the young girl from Kenya, for instance, his, her classmates knows her, they see the problem, and it's coming from her, and they feel that's ownership of this problem. And she also understands the limitations of the people she's working with, so and it's moving gradually. It will, like she said, she hopes it will graduate to a waste collection system like she sees here, which is really beautiful. It, uh, um, but that has to be that gradual process. So sometimes when we do take technologies crafted from outside, it just doesn't fit the society. So it's not that they resist, it's actually that the technology is like too good for the society at the level where, where it is, and that, that's a challenge. And that is where the, the kind of work that the Wilson Center is doing is really innovative in terms of creating partnerships with people in the communities that you want to work so that you ensure that the local knowledge about those people can be put into the fabrication of the technology, like you saw in the case of uh, Ghana. People went from uh, the Netherlands, the designers were from the Netherlands, but they didn't sit in the Netherlands. He, ha he had to bring them to Ghana, sit with the communities, get views from the farmers, and you create a product that is co-owned by, by everyone. That, that is really the new way that innovation is going globally. Yes? The lady behind. Good morning. Um, my name is Brittany Pruitt, and I had a question directed for Diana. Um, I just wanted to say it was really inspiring to hear your story um, as a young woman, like interested in environmental consciousness, and that you use the business model to spread that in your community. I thought that was really great. And my question is just, um, I believe you said you were getting ready to attend university, and I just wanted to know like, what your thoughts are on expanding your project and maybe bringing in other individuals in order to bring that, to replicate your project in other communities in Kenya and maybe across Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you. Um, I 
I really want to expand my project. Um, I started out with around 20 households, then I got to 15. Right now, I'm working with 80 households around mm -hmm. myself. Your mic, your mic, just press. Yeah. Yeah. This one, this one. Okay, just. Uh -huh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Now? Can you hear me now? Speak, <laughs> speak louder. <laughs> <laughs> Speak up, right? Eh? Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, I started out with 20 households, and then I graduated to 50. And um, later on this year, I got to 80 households. And the 80 households are in my hometown, Nakuru. And I intend on working with other with other areas in in not only Nakuru, but also to get into Nairobi to help um collect waste because um, the garbage collection problem is not only in my town, it is there in the main city, it is there in other smaller towns. And so um, because I've, I've, I have five workers who help me with my project and through the whole um, reaching out to more people and getting into other areas, I, I hope to employ other people and get, um, get even volunteers who, I'm sure there are so many youth in Kenya, actually my friends who tell when in school and they're told we need to do like, um, community service they come tell me so can i come do community service in your in your in your in your project so um hopefully i want to get more youth into the project and to even if they're not as they're not employed or they're part-time workers or they're volunteers i hope to get more people into the whole project and hopefully we want to earn to um reach out to as many towns as i can in kenya and to ensure that Garbage, coll the garbage collection system becomes an organized system as it is in other countries and to ensure that um, this does not only reflect um, inwards but reflect outwards to other countries in Africa. Okay. Thank you. So the hand here, lady in front. Hi, um, my name is Karia Tusila. I'm from Guinea. I'm currently a student. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Mugatut. Mugajitutu? Mugatutu. Mugatutu. And I have one for Ms. Well, one question for both of you, Mr. Sashi. Um, I'm very inspired by, you know, your innovative ways concerning technology and trade in Africa and making sure that there is some sort of market equilibrium in terms of Ghana and Kenya, but especially Africa as a whole, that supply meets demand. But I'm kind of, I'm not hearing anything about considering international trade, like there is a competition from China, there is a competition from other parts of Africa. So I don't know what you're doing in terms of assuaging the fears of these people that you work with, the traders or the, the people or the producers, um, because they're competing with l people who make larger uh, quantities of, of these goods that you're um, helping them to sell. So I don't know if you're working with the government or if you have some kind of policies in place in order to address the, uh, you know, the losing side of international trade. Yes. Great, okay. Uh, so I think basically uh, the reason why Vivus was founded was that uh, personally our focus um, is on domestic markets. Uh, we realize that when it comes uh, to African economies, especially agriculture, uh, for years, it was an export-led economy. So you had, uh, you know, very good feeder roads, a good infrastructure in terms of uh, exporting commodities such as coffee, cocoa, etc. But when it comes to domestic staples such as tomato, you know, uh, oranges, etc., uh, the the supply chain was quite informal and inefficient. So this is where uh, we've been focusing. Now, to give a, a sense of an, an answer to your question. I would say that you have uh, different, uh, we can see this from different angles. Uh, for example, um, uh, one initiative that uh, is currently being led in Ghana is that you have smallholder farmers or young, uh, uh, young uh, uh, people, unemployed people who are willing to get into agriculture. So the government of Ghana just bring them together and create what they call block farms, okay? So they just identify different areas uh, bring them into groups of 10 or 20, uh, you know, young uh, farmers, create those block farms. And part of those farms, farm, sorry, actually, uh, you, you can find export uh, commodities and you can find also uh, domestic food staples. 
and then uh, you know part of it can actually be exported and the rest goes to the local market so those are definitely something that is being uh, you know uh, promoted uh, but in my work personally uh, what we've been wi witnessing with small rural farmers is that uh, they have one big uh, worry and an issue that is emerging is uh, the question of the land grab okay uh, you have a lot of uh, gra lands currently in Ghana also uh, that you know <coughs> is being uh, chased after by huge investors or huge uh, uh, countries <coughs> and farmers small other farmers feel like you know they they currently feeling like restraint uh, in the area uh, i wouldn't say that i have any answers or any, so any solutions right now uh, but uh, this is uh, something when you interact with farmers they feel it and uh, and uh, that's why i think one of the solutions that is being promoted from uh, the government and from other organization is a shift away from the small holding farm you know uh, agriculture style to actually something where you can go through medium farms or large farms where they could eventually be able to uh, to to have a better uh, leverage yeah okay you want to give it okay um that's another question that that we have from the twitter and that is for m farm it says what other information or resources could you send to small scale farmers using the M Farm facility? Is interested in health, emergency responses, uh, and so on. Um, so the the kind of information that uh, we're looking to uh, send out farmers currently, okay, where we started out is uh, basic price information on different commodities. But what happens is um, farmers become knowledgeable, then you know, they move up a step. And once they get to that level whereby they know the, products, the, the, the price that their commodity is trading at, they start to ask another question. Where can I sell it? S so the, the kind of information we can send out to farmers, it, it, it sort of um, it, it, it grows um, level by level. So once they're able to trade, then they ask, okay, where, where can I get you know, affordable inputs? So the kind of information, again, we send back to them is based on the needs and not necessarily just sending out, out information just because we think, okay, um, farmers need information about, okay, weather patterns. It, it needs to come from the ground up. That way it makes more sense, um, the kind of information we're sending back. It, it's more meaningful and more useful to them. So we we take on that kind of a reverse approach. Uh, whatever comes up from the ground, then we send back the kind of information the farmer needs. So as of right now, we've been sending out price information, um, market linkage information, basically where you can sell your produce and um, interested buyers uh, for your produce. Um, uh, we, we actually also give them um, international market prices for different commodities like snow peas, sugar snaps just to get them in involved in knowledge of international markets and, and stuff like that. So uh, again, it's, it, it has to come from the ground up and driven by the, by the people on the ground, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. The man behind, then after this, the lady here. This one behind first. Behind. Thank you, I'm Roger Mark D'Souza. I work at the Environmental Change and Security Program here at the Wilson Center. And, and just yesterday, we had a very interesting discussion about innovations for community-based youth programs. And we, we had um, examples from the Philippines and, and Ghana. And, and some of the lessons that we discussed yesterday was um, innovations in youth programming that um, revolve around providing access to credit for youth and livelihood opportunities. And that was seen as a, a good practice that was being successful. And secondly, thinking of um, creating a space for youth in governance structures. So for example, there were examples given of, of youth being involved with local policymakers and creating policy champions who then brought on youth. And I, I wondered whether these were components that you had been thinking of in, in your work and in your projects. Are there ways that you're creating a new space, um, perhaps with men or with adults, 
to create opportunities for women and youth to continue to be innovators. Yeah. Oh. <coughs> so th thank you. In terms of, uh, for us, what we're doing is through all our programming, be it in terms of agribusiness or tech Techrica or Knock Knock, uh, there's a component that's very much program based. And so for each and every venture we have, there's a component of policy and youth leadership. And so there's a percentage in terms of the business structure, there's a percentage of the funds that is allocated to the program so we can, uh, so we can groom and mentor. Uh, just not, not just on the continent, but here as well, in terms of the policy, how is the legislative written? Uh, what do you need to do in terms of advocacy? In terms of how do you present? In terms of the media, how do you communicate? So all these uh, uh, basic, to a certain degree, basic know-hows on how to move uh, uh, a message that we also integrated in our programs. Just to add, um, for the Africa Youth uh, Forum on science for Science and Technology, and the also Africa Women Forum for Science and Technology, which uh, someone is going to talk about in the afternoon, is actually focused mainly on this. Uh, you can see these are innovations on the ground, social innovations trying to ad address social problems uh, immediately. But then they need a, a higher fr a structure that will help in terms of, you see a lot of questions in terms of how do you upscale what you're doing? Yeah, so that needs training, that needs mentorship, that needs policy frameworks and all those things. So that, that is coming on in, in an afternoon uh, presentation. So maybe we will talk more about that when we, when we get there. But then uh, one of the things that I, I'm thinking through sitting here is these are bright ideas, uh, but we do know that for innovation to thrive, you need finance. You need these policy frameworks you are talking about, so the market structures and everything. So how do we help these innovations not to become orphaned a few years down the line? And maybe when um, uh, Diana goes back to university, her waste collection program just dies with her. So how do we actually create sustainability? How do we make these things viable businesses that can continue even beyond the people that have originated it here? That would be something that can come out of these kinds of uh, discussions, and I feel we have really gained some milestone. So I'm, I'm already like thinking of uh, how to leverage the policy structures in Kenya, for instance, through the National Council for Science and Technology to see the, whether they can start providing support to this, these uh, young innovators and try to surround them with good mentors and how these things can move forward. That, that will be really very critical in, in moving these things forward because they, they certainly cannot upscale it on their own to, to its full potential. So I'd like to call on such ideas for those who are listening, Twitter, everywhere, if you have ideas, please, can you let them know? They have the ideas, they have started, they have taken the bold step, but they need to grow, they need to mature, they need to become competitive. They need to play not only in the rural markets, but also in the national markets, in the regional markets, in the international markets. But all those things need some forms of support and capacity strengthening. Yes, the next is the lady here. Hello, my name is Pat Scheid. I'm with the International Youth Foundation. I'm here with my colleague, Bai Kamara. And just along those lines, um, we uh, you can find us at, at iyfnet.org. Um, we have a program called Youth Action Net, which seeks to identify young social entrepreneurs globally. And we're, um, we provide uh, training and uh, planning support for uh, planning the future and viability, uh, sustainability of their uh, enterprises, uh, networking, mentoring, uh, platforms for continuing the conversation and support and also financial support. And we're in the process of uh, creating two regional institutes in Africa, one in Dakar and a second one that will be based in East Africa, we're still identifying the location. 
So I think we would love to just uh, connect with you, but also to hear any um, feedback or comments you have in terms of you know, strategies for reaching young social entrepreneurs on the continent and uh, you know what what you think about that. Okay. Any of you I have? I could tell you in terms of through our my th through um, a few years of international development work, most of the programs we worked on were about youth innovation, youth entrepreneurship, uh, diaspora engagement, and how to do a pairing system. Uh, so through those years, we developed relationships with some of the youth and some organizations. And for Agrifica, for instance, we're reaching out to the same youth we worked with in terms of global innovation, uh, youth innovation, leadership, and agribusiness. So most of them come from the, a former program that I had worked with. So this is how we reach out. And also, um, while we're marketing most of the platforms, uh, we, do, we did a soft launch and using Twitter and Facebook and other uh, mediums of, of reaching out to specific targeted markets, we've been able to garner some uh, youth that are interested in working with us. So that's how we have done it. Any of you something to add? Okay, then the other thing also is for some of these initiatives uh, like yours, it will be very necessary, like working with the regional agencies that are already on the ground or within these continents. So because one of the challenges now that's happening in the innovation air arena in Africa is multiple uh, uh, activities going on, and people will then, youths will get confused in mm -hmm. terms of where to go and how to, and then also it's not efficient use of resources. So it's uh, important that, that there's, there are linkages. Like for us at the ATPS, the Africa Youth Forum for Science and Technology, we work with the National Councils for Science and Technology to take forward the issues of building the capacities, the, tech the, the policy frameworks, and also national grants. Uh, the, the government of Kenya now has a youth fund, which I hope you, for if you haven't tapped on, on it from it, you try and, and do very quickly. And, and that, that creates national ownership of what is happening and also recognition for, for these youths in their countries and so on. So we can talk about this a little bit more later outside the, the forum. The next was here, then here, then behind. The lady in front. Uh, hello, my name is Erica Dankwa Asante. Um, I just wanted to commend all of you for what you've done. It's so difficult to go from the stage of having an idea in your mind, putting it on paper, and then implementing it. And it's very encouraging, especially for those of us who want to go back um, to see what you guys are doing. So definitely encouraging, maybe making a move in a few months or a year or so. So that's very encouraging. But one of the questions I want to ask you, I see a lot of organizations, like even bigger organizations, when they do projects, they forget to input as they develop their plans uh, monitoring and evaluation strategies. So I just wanted to know if all of you have monitoring and evaluation strategies built into your plans, and uh, if so, what are some of them? Because as we talk about mobile technology, et cetera, we can even do some of the monitoring and evaluating through SMS even, or I just want to know what you're doing. The other question is that you talked about the diaspora. So I just wanted to know how do all of you see the diaspora perhaps working with you? What can some of the diaspora organizations and um, various linkages here do for you? That's what I'm gonna ask. Yeah, yeah. great. Uh, I think in my case for Devos, I, I want to share two uh, very practical examples of what, what we've been doing in terms of monitoring and evaluation systems. Uh, for example, when we were actually uh, introducing our SMS-based uh, solution, uh, offering vendors the ability to order upfront their food produce. Uh, later, what we did is that when we actually registered uh, the so-called hundreds of women vendors, and uh, we realized that uh, they were not uh, using the platform as we intended it, you know, we wanted it, uh, uh, we expecting them to, to use it. And we found that that's one of our main hypotheses was challenged, was the fact that even though you present yourself as offering uh, the cheapest prices on the market, the woman will still have the ob ability to shop around uh, and, and to, to say, okay, I want to shop to this market <coughs> to, 
go to that vendor because I believe I could get a better prices. Uh, so what we did in that instance, and that we're exploring right now, is that we actually sent our same field agents, okay, uh, to spend quality times with those women vendors and to try to understand what are the factors, you know, that are psychologically preventing them or, uh, you know, from using the platform. Uh, so uh, what we found out, for example, and these are, you know, some of the next steps that we, we plan on, 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 on using, is that uh, we found out, for example, that uh, some of the women, for example, would like when the SMS is being sent to have, uh, you know, a kind of comparison SMS that lists the price in the market and the price that we are offering them, for example. Initially, we were not doing that. We just send an SMS with our pricing and say, okay, we can give you tomato at this price. So for example, they want to compare the market where they sell, you know, this is the price that I can get in the market, and Vivus, this is the price that you're offering me right now. Another thing we saw uh, as an, a, a potential next step is that uh, uh, instead of just going through and speaking to hundreds of women vendors, Another strategy is that we want to take them you know, into small groups, 20, 30 women vendors, and have the chance to pick up uh, what we call a lead woman vendor. And sometimes uh, what we would like to do is to have that lead woman vendor sponsor her for a trip in the market. So the point she goes to the market and she's able to come back and say, hey, you know, this is the pricing that is currently happening. And then the SMS is being sent and then she's able to, you know, figure out if, uh, she, in advance, the lead woman vendor is able to know uh, the pricing that is uh, is being applied in the market. This, those are just, uh, uh, you know, a couple of things that we're exploring. Uh, I think as a lean startup, these are some of the things that we're still exploring. We don't have definitely the answer, but yeah, those are stuff that we're exploring. So in terms of the diaspora, uh, I'm a member of the diaspora as well. I've been working back and forth on the continent, and one of the things is we're working on is to create the linkages between the diaspora and the continent, especially the youth, youth entrepreneurs. Uh, also, the diaspora can play a great role in developing the SMEs on the continent and through diaspora direct investment. This is something that we've been trying to develop with a few partners, and uh, if you want to discuss about it, we are more than welcome to discuss with you in terms of how the diaspora can actually contribute in developing the SMEs in, on the continent. Okay. We, we have the last two questions, so close this one and this one behind. Yes, the lady behind. Hello, my name is Edith from Kenya. I would like to ask Isaac a question. Uh, first of all, congratulations for your very good presentations and innovations. Uh, given that uh, a lot of Kenyan, especially the small-scale farmers, are almost semi-illiterate or illiterate, how does your technology, how do you design your technology to ensure that they do not have language challenges? Are you considering maybe using Swahili or using their uh, local languages? I'm just asking these questions uh, for, for the purposes of scaling up your, your technology. And then to all of you, the, the presenters of today, I would also like to maybe not really pose a question, but a challenge. How, how what efforts are you making to ensure that uh, especially those who are working with farmers, that these farmers are actually adding value to whatever it is they're producing. Because again, if there is no value addition, then we, we still remain, you know, they still remain poor and the same vicious cycle continues. For instance, how do you empower a farmer to, to, to produce, say, French fries rather than bring raw potatoes to the market? <coughs> so, thank yeah. you. Let's have the second question and then you can address it collectively. Uh, good morning. My name is Marjorie Macieda. Again, the presentations were wonderful, very inspiring. Um, when people crack eggs to make omelets, sometimes some people get upset, get worried. Um, in particular, I was thinking uh, with Mr. Isaac's project, the middleman, has that been an issue? Have they become threatening? And in some of the other circumstances, too, since you're working with different <coughs> people in different circumstances, have any of you felt any challenge or threats that in the future could become more problematic? Okay, back to you for your final answers to this and last words to us, because after this we'll have to close. Um, I think, Edith, uh, to answer your new illiteracy issue is um, we have agents uh, on the ground on a day, uh, in, in different areas, and again, as I said, it's a trust system, so we, we are trying to roll out uh, sort of trainers of trainers uh, kind of network, whereby we go on the ground and we actually train 
uh, farmers on how to use the system. So we have trainers of trainers. So we train one person and they they train another person and they keep on training. Um, so that's on illiteracy on how to use the system. So we have trainers of trainers on the ground. About language, our system has a learning system whereby, for example, if today a farmer in uh, Western Kenya sends um, a query on price of maize, they, they call it Oduma there. So they, they send price Oduma Kisumu, for example. So the first time, the system will, will just blank out. But the second time, what we do is it, it picks up, okay, so in Kisumu they call maize Oduma. So it picks that up and, and creates an alias to, to, to that produce. So the next time somebody else, you know, it, so it keeps on learning and it, it takes a bit of time for it to, to pick up this the, this wordings, but yeah, we have a learning system just for scaling up purposes. Um, value adds, um, we're currently collecting a lot of data on production of various crops at, across the country. And we've been doing this for the past nearly two and a half years now. And we are yet to, to bring this information to the public. And what we are looking to achieve is once we were able to map out the seasonality patterns of different crops and products across the country in different zones, um, we are looking to, for, he, he talked about this investment fund to the youth. We are looking to work with the county governments and uh, that fund to bring the youth again back into investing, back in, into the areas that, 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 that they come from. So, for example, in a place uh, like Machakos, every year come uh, December to February, there's a lot of uh, mangoes being produced. So much. We went down to the farms. Every single year, they rot in the farms. And we've, we've noticed the cycle. And we, we are collecting data on this. So once we bring that information to light, what happens is we go into the county government of that area, talk to, to the young people in that area, engage that fund, and you know we tell them what? This is what happens over the past years. This product, this commodity, um, people plant it, people don't buy it, it goes bad. We think, so, so we, we throw the, 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 um, the opportunity back to them. We, we tell them, we think if you set up a juice factory down in this area, it'll make more sense and you can sell the juice locally or internationally depending on the quality and uh, various other factors that come into play. So we, we, we're still collecting data, but we need it to be enough to make sense. So that's the, the, the issue about value. Add. So maybe in due course, we'll, we'll roll out some f form of analyzed data that will make sense to bring in value adds. Again, we don't want to go into it too early and um, break stuff. Um, the question about middlemen, um, we, we, we're also catering for that in our agents. We have an agents system. Agents um, are refined middlemen. Um, they, they, they work under MFAM, so we take them through training of the whole value chain. We um, give them a proposition, do you want to work with us? Then you get a certain percentage on commission of sales of whatever goes through the, the system, through them as an agent, based on the number of farmers that they are able to bring into MFAM. So we, we are addressing the middleman issue. Yes, there's a lot of uh, resistance and uh, th they're trying to fight us because we are, we are bringing transpa transparency into the value chain, which I is not there at all, whereby we're sending money that's due to the farmer straight to the farmer and not through third parties. So nobody's handling the cash. It's going straight to the farmer and any commission going straight to the agent, to their mobile phones. So whatever payment systems that we have in place, it's totally transparent. You can see commissions that Enfa made, commissions that the agent made, and how much the farmer got at the end of the day. And breaking the 10 middlemen kind of system into just uh, two, three guys uh, on our Enfa value chain, okay? Okay, thanks. That's it. Any last words? I mean, final words, not last words. <laughs> 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 yeah, great. Uh, I just wanted to say that in terms of... Um, in terms of value addition, uh, what Vivus is trying to do at the end of the day is that uh, when we're going to rural communities, we're trying to solve the first mile challenge, just to make sure that uh, uh, farming communities and farmers uh, have the mobility that is adequate in the rural communities. 
And when it comes also to women vendors that are selling food staples in uh, cities, uh, the idea is that uh, we just, through our technology system and the assistance we're bringing to them, to just make sure they move a little bit out of the informal stance they are through a better formal uh, uh, stance. So we're working on that. Thank you. What? We are working on creating linkages, linkages, and linkages, partnership, partnerships, and partnerships, and programs to scale both the continent Africa and also US-Africa relations. So not all our program, including in terms of our services so that we offer through strategic partnerships that we have established, is truly to uh, make sure that there's, a pr there's a, an aspect of development, there's an aspect of youth <coughs> development, empowerment, and also integrating uh, access to information, digitizing Africa, building content about Africa, positive content. In terms of our monitoring and evaluation is if we're able to have, when you Google and you put Africa or if you put Benin, Togo, Chad, or any country of the African continent or any city, you're able to see in the first 10 pages the positive aspect of Africa. Then we would have succeeded. Thank you. Now, do you have a last uh, 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 final word for this session? Um, through my project, I hope to involve um, the Kenyan government, um, many organizations, international and both local, to put um, their focus into the environmental conservation because I believe that it's really important for all of us to get involved in, in environmental conservation because when you have everyone involved, the change is much easier and faster to get to everyone. Yes, thank you. Okay. I think with that, um, I would like to encourage you, all the all of you who are presenters here, um, it's been alluded to by many of you, it is very expensive not to collaborate. <laughs> yeah? So try as much as possible. There are platforms out there like the, that's a youth and women innovation uh, challenge program that the ATPS is running. And there are lots of mentors in all the countries on, of the continent that can help and also access to your governments and other international agencies that you can actually use that to be able to upscale what you're doing. Because like Edith said, if what you're doing remains at the local level, uh, I know that's not your vision. It's not, uh, there's economies of scale in upscaling. So we, that's an area that I really like to discuss more with you on how we can help you, um, you know, make all your flowers blossom for Africa so that all the pages <laughs> of Google will be positive. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before we officially close this session and, and, and thank our panel here and our wonderful moderator, uh, I just want to say a couple of words. I mean, first of all, if nothing more comes out of this day than the fact that you've all met each other. Mm. that you've met the persons in the audience, you see the kinds of resources that are out there. I mean, I hope that uh, Rahel will be talking to each of these folks about promotion, and, and I hope that uh, Im Farm is going to be talking to Vivus uh, because you guys have a continental but vision, and you're doing very similar things. You talk together. And Diane. I mean, I'm gonna see you do want to go on and get your college degree, but you know, waste management is the highest growing uh, 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 companies uh, in the United States and, and, and it's making a lot, a lot of money. So it, things can be done. Um, but it is, as you said, all about partnerships and, and there's many resources in this audience. Now, we did one thing kind of accidentally, but I think it's working out extremely well. We had actually reached out for some high ranking official to give us a little keynote address at our lunch that we're about to break for. Uh, talk, talk, ask someone from Microsoft. We, we didn't get anyone. Then we decided, wait a minute. This is so rich and so uh, so invigorating. Why don't we just give you all an hour to eat your lunch in comfort and to network with each other? It's all about networking. So we are about to break for lunch. Go across the hallway. Staff will guide you. Uh, you'll find a nice lunch there, and uh, and we want you just to talk to each other. This is the time to, to spend an hour getting to know one another. And let me thank Kevin for wonderful moderation of this session. You are a, you are a, a treat to have with us. And please let us thank the the panelists for very beautiful presentations and inciting. more importantly to thank the Wilson Center for creating this forum for us and I hope we will be in this partnership for you.
next time later. And we'll reconvene in about an hour. <laughs> Rahel, do you know Paul Sika? Yes. How do you He's a very good friend. I'm the guy that was organizing TEDx Abidjan. Oh, it's me. I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew your name. Yeah, I'm doing good. Nice to meet you. Oh, wow, what a small yeah, one. Yeah, huh? I'm, I'm telling you. Yeah. Yeah. He's a smoker. Yes, oh, we've nice. a couple of times.